My guest is Sharon Janes, and she has a passion to equip women to live fully and free. Sharon has served as the Vice President of Proverbs 31 Ministries for 10 years. Currently a co-founder of Girlfriends in God, she released a book called When You Don't Like Your Story. I know many who are watching can relate to this book, Sharon. How have you used your story to help others? Hey, you know, I know you've already said the title of the book, but let's just say it again. When you don't like your story, what if your worst chapters could become your greatest victories? You know, there, there have been so many chapters in my life that I did not like. And God has used those very chapters the most to help minister to other people. And, and I think probably the, the best story, I mean, don't we all love our salvation story the most, but, um, let me just tell you a little bit about that because, you know, uh, um, sometimes when I'm speaking with people or I'm just meeting someone and just because, you know, my, my clothes might match or I have a smile on my face and they think, well, what does she know about pain? I mean, she's got a nice husband. She has a son. She has even a cute dog. I mean, you know, what does she know? But then once I tell them my story, um, they realize that we're all the same and we've all got pain in our lives. So my story has allowed me, it's, it's a bit of an open door um, to ministry and to just show people that, um, yes, God can do his most miraculous work on the backdrop of, of dark stories. So let me just share a little bit about that. It's so, so much. I can't share the whole thing, but you know, I was not raised um, in a Christian home. I was raised in a very difficult situation. Um, we looked good though. We lived in a nice neighborhood. Uh, we went to church on Sunday uh, my father was a businessman. My mom had her own old business, a craft shop. She taught painting classes and, and something so funny about that. I remember when I was growing up and these old ladies would come in her shop, old, like 35, and they would come in their shop, in her shop with these little bags of all their arts and crafts supplies. And, and then what I remember being 35 and going into a little craft shop with my art supplies, I thought, Oh no, I'm turning into my mother. But, um, but so we looked like a, you know, a normal family on the outside, but there was a lot of violence behind the, that pretty door of my home. My father drank a lot. And when he would get drunk, he would beat my mom. He, she would hit back. There were so many words that flow around our house. And you know what? I, I didn't know what some of those words meant, but I knew how they made me feel. And I can remember as a child, um, when they would start fighting and it would become violent and I would hide under the covers and just pray that I could shut the noise out. And sometimes I would hide in my closet. Sometimes I would run in my brother's room who was five years older than me and, and hide with him. So I grew up in a, in a, a very volatile household. And then after one of those, those violent nights, the next day I would wake up. My dad would be crying at the kitchen table saying, I'm so sorry. It'll never happen again. My mom would go into a period of, of, um, of passive aggressive silence and wouldn't speak for a while. And, and it would be better for a little bit. But then I could always feel, even as a little girl, when that was getting ready to, to ramp up and it would get more tense and more tense until it would happen again. And it happened all through my childhood. But God didn't leave me that way or my parents that way. Um, when I was about 12 years old, I started hanging around with one of my friends in the neighborhood. And I'd spent a lot of time down at her house on the next block. And Mr. and Mrs. Henderson um, loved each other, had little pet names for each other. And I've never even seen married people act like that. And I was so drawn to that family because of the love there. And then she would sing little praise songs about Jesus. Uh, you know, honestly, I thought she was strange because she talked about Jesus like she knew him personally. And remember, with all this going on in my house, there was alcohol, there was pornography, there was the violence. We went to church on Sundays. We walked in. People said, how are you? We said, what? Fine. We weren't fine. But then I started going to church with the Hendersons. And what I, you know, I don't think I could have verbalized this as a 12-year-old. But I know now we had a religion in our lives. They had a relationship with Jesus. Mm, that's a, well, big, that's it, a difference. It's a, it's a big difference. And it was about a, a two year period where she mentored me, loved me, told me I had a heavenly father who loved me so much and 
finally, it's a, it's a longer story, but when I was 14, I accepted Christ as my Savior, and he did change my life. But you know what the problem was? I had to go back home into that violent environment. And now my little group of 14-year-old friends and Mrs. Henderson's friends praying for my family. And three years after I came to Christ, um, I actually went out of the country for a summer. I didn't want to go because I was, by that time, I was the parent and I was the one breaking up the fights. And I thought, I can't leave my parents. But my group of, of now 17-year-old friends, listen, we were awesome. I tell you, when you've got a, a teenager on fire for the Lord, it is a sight to behold, isn't it? Yes. But yes. Um, it is. And they, they prayed over me, prayed over my house and said, you know what? We believe you should go. And I did. I left. And uh, while I was gone, my dad started a fight. This is the Cliff Notes version, but my dad started a fight. I wasn't there to help. Mom ran down to Mrs. Henderson's and she gave her life to the Lord that night. So that is a very quick version of, of what happened with her. And you know what? My dad quit drinking after that. And he said, you know, I will go to church with you. I'm not going to drink anymore, but I could never become a Christian because I've done too many things in my life. God could never forgive me. Mm. Now that's what I want you to hold on to. I had to tell the little bit of backdrop to, to get to my, where my father was. But we began to pray for him and pray for, well, I was already praying for him, but now my mom was praying for him. And, and I just, before we were chatting and you held up a book, praying for your husband from head to toe that I wrote, well, this is where that started, learning how to pray for a man and watch what God can do through a woman's prayers. But we pray for my father and about three years after my mom, so this is six years after me, um, my dad was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. There had been a business deal that has, had gone wrong. He was going to be taken to court and sued. And no telling what was going to come out on that stand in the small town that I grew up in. Well, my mom was in a meeting in Pennsylvania. Now, we were living in, in eastern North Carolina. My dad needed my mom, got in his car, drove about 400 miles to Pennsylvania to try to find her, couldn't find her at her meeting, stopped at a church and said, I need someone to pray for me. Um, the, the secretary said, the priest isn't here, but I know a Baptist pastor who's out in the woods building his church. I mean, hammer and nail building. And my father was a builder, had to build a supply company. She drew a little map on a scrap piece of paper. And my dad got in his car and followed that map. And he fit, was in the woods of Pennsylvania with a man I'll never know. And then he drove up and said, I need you to pray for me. So Alan, he said, sit down with me on this blog and, and tell me your story. And my dad, probably for the first time, told all that he had done and, and what had led up to this moment. And that man who thought God could never forgive him told his story. Mm -hmm. And then that pastor put his arm around my father. And he said, now, Alan, let me tell you my story. The way my dad explained it to me, he said, Sharon, everything I had done in my life, this man had done too. And I knew that if God could forgive him and he could be a preacher, then he could forgive me. So because of that man's story, those, those worst chapters in his life, and him sharing those with my dad, my dad was able to relate. Jesus wasn't any longer just someone who was written about in a book or a picture on a wall. He saw Jesus and that man because of that man's story. And he gave his life to the Lord. He went in that woods, a sinner, and he came out a saint. And why? You know, yes, we know it's because of the power of the Holy Spirit, but it was the power of the Holy Spirit working through that man's story. So, so that is the power of our story and those, the power of, of those dark parts that we at one time, probably wish we could rip out of the book. We want to tear it out, erase it, whatever we can do to make that story go away. But listen, those stories are what show people how the power of God in our lives. And I got to see that firsthand, you know, with my own father. And, and you know, one of my favorite verses is in Revelation where it says they overcame him. That's talking about the devil, Satan, whatever you want to call him. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. 
Listen, your story is so powerful that it's in the same sentence with the blood of the lamb. I mean, that is amazing. So no wonder the devil doesn't want you telling your story. No wonder the enemy wants you to be ashamed and keep it to yourself because he knows there's so much power in it. So that is a long answer to your question, but, but that is one way that I have seen um, God used one of the darkest chapters in my life. Um, as a springboard for ministry. It gives people hope that no matter how bad someone is, they can continue to pray for them and can and know that God answers those prayers. You know, I, I used to joke and say, remember that old song, Bad, Bad, Leroy Brown, Bad <laughs> Man in the Whole Town? Well, if you're old enough to remember that or you've heard it on the oldie station, listen, my dad was worse than Leroy Brown. But look what God did. It, and you know what? He became one of the sweetest men I've ever known. Mm. But I want to go back. It was because there was another man who wasn't ashamed to tell his story. Mm. And we need to not be ashamed mm -hmm. to tell ours. I love the way God sends people into your life exactly when you need them. Amen. And, and he did that like it was a thread between you and your father. I could see that like, you know, sending you over to the to your neighbor's house sending him to that past to that pastor to help him see you know talk about his life story so this is wonderful so what how is god inspiring your heart to write this book okay let me go back and comment on what you just said okay because sure. there is, there is a chapter in here called um about God working in the meanwhile. And a lot of times when we're praying, especially when we're praying for someone else, or maybe we're praying for one of our own circumstances. Maybe you're praying for a prodigal son. Maybe you're praying for um, your financial situation. You know, the difficulties we go through and we're praying, God, why are you not answering that prayer? Well, God, listen, God, if then you don't see God working does not mean that he isn't. Because Jesus said, my father is always working and he is working behind the scenes. He is working the way I phrase it is he is working in our meanwhile. And the way I came up with that is, you know, the story of Joseph. And if you don't know the story of Joseph, please go back and read it in the last chapters um, of Genesis. It's an amazing story. But Joseph was the 11th son born to his father, Jacob. There was one after him named Benjamin. And, and he had some dreams that he, one day his family was going to bow down to him. And unfortunately he shared that dreams with his brothers. Now they already didn't like him. He was already his father's favorite. He's, you probably heard of him as the, the one that had the coat of many colors. I mean, that would be like having favorite son monogrammed on our shirt. So they didn't like him. Well, he had these dreams that he was going to have a great life. But that's not what happened at first. His brothers hated him. They threw him in a cistern thinking he would die. Then they sold him into slavery. Then he went to work for Potiphar. He was accused of attempted rape, which he did not do. He was thrown into prison. And at every step, it says that God was with him. And one verse says, meanwhile, and then it goes on to tell what was happening. Say, so meanwhile, None of that was an accident. None of it was, oh, God, you really messed up here. You're not paying attention. No, see, God, all those years for Joseph, when he was in slavery, when he was in prison, God was working in the meanwhile to set up the circumstances that would be perfect for him to go in and be the Pharaoh's secondhand man. And then we know at the end of that story at, and back at the very end in Genesis 50, where it's like the brothers come because there's this uh, famine and, and um, Joseph ends up saving, of course, through the seven years of, of famine, saving the, the Egyptian people as he becomes the second in command in the Pharaoh, under the Pharaoh. But his brothers are so terrified because of, of what they have done to him. And this, this, what they set into motion. But, Je but, but Joseph says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good and the saving of many lives. Man, what a perspective. But here's what Joseph knew. A lot of bad stuff happened to him. A lot of bad stuff has happened to me. I am sure a lot of bad stuff has happened to you. That doesn't mean that God caused it, 
But what it does mean is God is working behind the scenes. He is working in our meanwhile so that his greater purpose can be accomplished. So no matter what you're going through today, don't think that God's forgotten you. Don't think that he doesn't see you. He does see you. And I know it's hard, but listen, God is working behind the scenes in our meanwhile. Why do I know that? Because Jesus said so. He said, I, my father is always working and God still has the pen in his hand and he is still writing your story, even though you might be in a bad chapter. How so wonderful. Nancy, what was the question you asked me? How I just really wanted wonderful. to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could just end here, but I did have another question for you. Okay. Um, so my, my other question was, um, how did God inspire your heart to write this book? Just before we end this well, I, um, as I have been in ministry, this is my 25th book, and I have been in ministry with women for over 30 years. One thing that I have seen among people that have um, the, the most powerful ministries is they never had their stories. They are using their stories to bring others to Christ and to help people with their healing. And I know that every single one of us listening today um, has a story. And God wants to use your story. But let me say this, you know, it's not just your story isn't just telling every bad thing that ever happened to you. That's not it at all. And that's not what I'm suggesting. You know, some people are not ready to tell their stories. And we need to get ready. So let me give you four steps that you need to go through before you are ready to tell your story. One is to be willing to tell it. Be willing to tell your story. Another is we need to forgive those people who have hurt us. As long as we're carrying bitterness and anger and resentment in our hearts because of what has been done to us, we are not ready to tell our stories. I was at a, a football game one time, a college football game, and I was sitting by this um, on the very end of a row. And for some people, for reason, as the people came up and down my, that row, those steps, they kept tripping on my step. And it really got kind of comical after a while. They didn't get hurt. They just tripped. And um, at the halftime, I measured, and that step was a little bit higher than the other steps. And forgiveness, which is the, the basis of our entire Christian faith, is a, is a little bit higher step. And we need to forgive those people who've hurt us. That doesn't mean we're saying it was okay or it didn't matter. Forgiveness is a gift you give yourself. It is um, unforgiveness. It's like drinking a poison and waiting for the other person to die. Maybe you've heard that before. Um, but when we forgive someone, we are taking the burden of the resentment, the bitterness, and we're, we're getting free, we're freeing ourselves from it. And we're giving that to God. There's, we could do a whole session on forgiveness and we can't do that today. But I want to just leave you with that. The third is we need to forgive ourselves. Now, some people say, well, that's not really biblical, but that's the way most people would, would phrase it. They say, I know God can forgive me, but I can't forgive myself. Basically, what I'm meaning when I say that is that we need to receive God's grace and forgiveness and stop carrying around the shame. Forgiving other people is coming out of the pain place. Uh, forgiving ourselves is coming out of the shame place. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you this fourth step is telling your story after you have done those first two. But when you tell your story, see, Satan doesn't have anything else to use against you once you tell your story because you're turning around and using it for good. It tells us in the scripture, it says that God comforts us in all of our affliction or trouble, depending on which um, translation you're using so that listen underline it circle it so that we can comfort other people with the same comfort we have received from god so why do we tell our story so that we can help other people to be healed as well thank you so much for joining me today sharon thank you for having me you can get sharon's newest book when you don't like your story at sharonjanes.com you can watch The Call with Nancy Sebado on YouTube, listen on podcasts through Apple, Spotify, Audible, iHeartRadio, and so many more. Be sure to join us next time, and until then, may the Lord richly bless you.